Professor Riz, it's really wonderful to have you here, here with us in Tokyo, and especially from IGES Japan. We're so glad that you accepted our invitation and that you've spent the last two days with us and uh, you just gave a keynote talk here at the United Nations University, which apparently was very well received. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I really do appreciate the invitation. Thank you. This has uh, taken a long time, but uh, finally we got there. Uh, we have a number of questions, uh, if, if you don't mind. I put this in the context of uh, the continuous attacks that we're getting, especially from politicians in the corporate world on science, trying to uh, uh, disparage scientists or scientific messages. And my question to you is, what is the relevance of, of science to design of sustainability policy? Well, I'm a scientist, so obviously I have a very strong bias. And I think you cannot design sustainability policy without a good, solid scientific basis. But we're dealing here with a political framework. This is a political issue. And politics is all about competing values. So what we have today, in my opinion, is a, an economic paradigm based on perpetual economic or material growth propelled by continuous technological improvement. But it's creating a world which is a complete mismap of the nature of biophysical reality. So that's the conflict. And those who have a vested interest in maintaining the current paradigm are going to fight like hell because the scientific paradigm is almost a diametric opposite. It's one that's composed of limits, of lags, of thresholds, and completely unpredictable systemic behaviors that are likely to crash the system as we go in this direction. Mm. So you could hardly have two more opposing visions of reality, and so we should not be surprised when this status quo is defended with such vigor by the uh, those who have the greatest stake in maintaining. The, could this then be a case that, especially in the light of this uh, attacks on science and this fight back from our vested interests, could it then be the case that scientists are not really looking at the political economy of this issue? Well, of course, look, scientists are explicitly trained uh, to focus on the data, on the information. In fact, I remember a course when I was doing my undergraduate years that explicitly said, if you want to be a good scientist, you stay out of politics. What you need to do is do the best possible provision of information. Let the political process decide what it will do with that information. And so many, many scientists don't want to be tainted by getting involved in the political fray. Because I said a moment ago, politics is all about competing sets of values. Values have nothing to do with measurement, right? So uh, scientists, to maintain their luster as objective assessors of the nature of reality, can't be tainted with being associated with one or another set of values. And when a scientist does step out and align himself with one of the parties in this kind of debate, they're often tarred by the rest of their profession and shunned. So there's a, a, a rather a disincentive for scientists to get too actively involved in the politics of sustainability. Is there a need to change that, though? Oh, I, I think there is, and I'm, I'm a perfect example of it. I, I think we have to uh, be much more responsible. The stakes are so high today that scientists have a responsibility to the common good, to the public, uh, to get their message out. We don't necessarily have to interpret it, but at least we have to say, look here, you're being told over and over again that renewable energy is, is replacing fossil fuel. The reality is that it is not. Right now, in 2018, renewable, at least uh, solar and wind energy, provide about 3% of the world's energy supply. And that's after, what, 30 years of, of development? 85% of the world's energy is still fossil fuel, and it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future. Don't think otherwise. But if it is going to be that way, and then we're confronting major climate change. The people ought to know that so that they have a, a rational basis for making their own political decisions about which side they want to align themselves. I'd like to ask you about the uh, ecological footprint concept for which you're, you're very famous and, uh, and also consumption-based accounting for environmental impacts in general. Can you 
tell us how was this initially received and, and how people gradually became convinced of the need for this perspective? I'm not sure they're convinced yet. <laughs> But, I am sure know, they're the, convinced the, the hall was full. Okay. The, the, the ecological footprint, I think, is a unique tool in many respects. Uh, when we first began thinking about it, I, I designed it to personalize people's contact with nature, but also with consumption. So the ecological footprint is a consumption-based index of people's um, demands on the planet. So when I was a young kid, even, I used to lie away. I, I grew up on a farm in southern Ontario, at least part of my life. And I used to wonder how much of the earth is needed to support me. And that's where the germ of this idea came from. It was because I had direct, hands-on experience working the earth on a farm. So many years later, I, I won't get into the details, but I said, well, I can really work this through. So what the ecological footprint does is take the average consumption of an individual or a population over a year, follow it back through the production process to the land base that produces all of that, and computes how much productive agricultural land, forest land, grassland, waste assimilation land is needed to sustain a particular individual or population's pattern of consumption. We all have an ecological footprint, whether we are conscious of it or not, and this personalizes it. The use of the term footprint, that's a physical impression we make on the land. So it's a metaphor that communicates to people. If I had called this, as I did at one time, the human impact index, nobody would have ever heard of it. But the footprint metaphor brings it home. Now people can connect the physicalness of a footprint and realize, well, you know, that's an allegory or, uh, for my real demand on nature which raises the next really important thing about the footprint. It's the only index of sustainability that enables us to compare the supply that nature provides with the demands we make on it. When we convert one's personal lifestyle to the area of earth needed to sustain that lifestyle, we can compare it with the area that's available. So we know by you know, any atlas of resources that there's only about 12 billion productive hectares of land and water on the planet. Well, divide that by 7 billion people, and you come up with your per capita fair share. If I can then compare that with my actual ecological footprint, then I have a basis for knowing whether I'm within the Earth's carrying capacity. There's a concept called one planet living. We only have one planet. If we exceed the productive capacity of that planet, we destroy the biophysical basis of our own existence. So one planet living means we all should be leave, living at an average of mo, no more than 1.7 global average hectares of productivity. I'm a Canadian, and if I'm an average Canadian, I'm using six. So I'm using almost four times my fair share. And it becomes completely obvious, even to a school child, we, we teach this to children now, mm. that if you're using four times your fair share, that means if everybody on the planet rose to your level of consumption, We'd need four additional planet Earths to sustain that levels of consumption. If we try to do it on one planet, then we can only do it by dis, uh, consuming the fish stocks, the soil, the forests, and, in other words, destroying the biophysical basis mm. of our own existence. So it's a very powerful way of comparing supply and demand, and uh, basically to show how some of us are vastly over-consuming, while other people are vastly under-consuming. Poor people get by on a, a half hectare or less, much less than their fair share of what comes out there. Which brings me to the question, actually, is, is there a risk of uh, putting too much burden on the individual without recognizing the structural issues or the context within which consumption happens? That's an excellent question, because one of the things that's happened in the last 30 years as we've moved more and more toward a neoliberal economics is, is an offloading of responsibility onto the individual. Uh, this is not an individual problem. This is a collective problem. Unsustainability is a reflection of the nature of the social and cultural paradigm under which we all operate. It's a collective problem that requires collective solutions. Some of the solutions involve major tax reform. The carbon tax is a perfectly good example. But I, as an individual, can't implement a carbon tax. That has to be put in place by the government on behalf of the common good. I, as an individual, can't redesign and, and uh, implement a program of rapid transit in my city. That is something that the city government must do on behalf of the, the common good. So we have to 
offload this responsibility from individuals and recognize that it, it is a, it's a problem of the collective. I hate using the term because people bristle at it, but that's the reality. There seems to be, a, especially from national governments and, and of course industry, a growing interest in uh, technology as a solution. In fact, it's being presented as the solution to the problem of unsustainability. And uh, I, obviously you disagree because you've just made a statement that we're in, <laughs> we're in overshoot. But what do you say to people that are advocating this approach? Well, it's grasping at straws. I mean, everybody likes a good news story. People are inherently optimistic. We don't like to hear that we're on a sinking ship. And so if technology offers a solution, uh, we, we're willing to grasp at it. And of course, look at the amazing technological advances we've made. I mean, one example I'm, I'm doing in my pocket, it's called the cell phone. This device has more computing power than the entire University of Toronto did when I was doing my a PhD there. But there was one computer that was shared by the university and two or three big businesses downtown. It occupied a room three times as big as this. It consumed thousands of watts of electricity. It heated the whole building. Okay, now an economist will tell you, look at the amazing advances in technology. We now have such efficiency that all of that is con down to one little machine like this. Right? But here's the problem. By becoming so efficient through technology, we can now make billions of these and laptops and desktop computers so that the total amount of energy and materials used in computing is vastly larger than it would have been had we not made those technological gains. So I'm not trying to say technology isn't wonderful and that we don't need it. It's part of the solution. But if we let it be the solution, we'll quickly see that it's, it's our enemy as much as our friend. Yes, technology is important. We need to get more efficient. But if efficiency is simply allowed to spin off and rebound so that uh, you know we actually consume more because we've saved money over here, we'll spend it over there, uh, then that's not going to work. So let's use technology to get more efficient, but in ways that actually reduce material and energy throughput. So my bottom line is this. If your solution, if your technological solution does not reduce the absolute material, energy, and throughput in society, it's not part of the solution. If it increases our energy and material consumption, you're adding to the problem. Uh, you're, of course, uh, famous for being a Blue uh, Planet Prize winner. You're, you've also visited Japan a good number of times. You have lots of friends here, I you know. And you've spent uh, the last four days with us uh, here and there doing many other things as well. I would like to ask you, from both from your general understanding of industrialized countries, but also a bit more specific about Japan, what, what your current impressions are of where it is. Well, look. I wrote to my wife last night that once again, I'm enormously impressed with the civility, the decency, the kindness, and the general sense of well-being I get being with the people of Japan. So you seem to have an unusual sense of cohesion at the cultural level and all of that. Uh, it's one of the cleanest cities I've ever seen in my life. I was making comparisons <laughs> with Vancouver. I haven't found a, a cigarette package on the street here, and I don't see bums stumbling around on the street corners as we do in many North American cities. So on one level, Japan is incredibly well positioned to lead forward in the uh, struggle for sustainability because of the apparent coherence and, and civility of the population, and presumably some joint vision of where we ought to go. That said, Japan still has an excess ecological footprint. Japan is still concerned about its population decline when it should seize upon this as a uh, possible means by which to show the rest of the world how to move forward with a declining population and a declining GDP, which is what we need to do if we're going to really achieve sustainability. So let's turn that little problem, as Japanese see it, into a, a, a solution Policies to manage a, a, an aging population and a, a slightly declining GDP might be needed in the rest of the world. In any case, Japan is very much like the rest of us in the techno-industrial society. 
in that it depends and still believes that technology is going to pull us out of this fight and we will uh, survive and go on to bigger and better things. And that, that is the myth that we have to at least have a counter myth. And let's see who, whose myth wins out in the end. <laughs> Professor Is, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Lewis. Thank you.